Hello, my name is Teach. This will be part four of understanding the world of Ice and Fire, and this will be all about Old Town. If you haven't seen part one through three, they will be linked up above now. In the previous videos, we learned about dragons, giants, and the children of the forest. And we heard about legendary characters, such as the Winged Knight from the Vale, the Green King of the God's Eye, Corliss Casterly of Casterly Rock, Balin Blackskin of the Iron Islands, and Garth Greenhands of the Reach. So over the last few episodes, I proposed a theory that Nissa Nissa was a Mother Earth Goddess, and she was violated somehow by the First Men. If you take into consideration that Gesray is of the most importance to the First Men, you might be able to theorize that Nissa Nissa invited the First Men to her island, probably to initially discuss a peace. It seems that maybe the Winged Knight wanted to marry her, but the Casterly wanted his right to the First Knight. But during this violation, she screams out in agony and it breaks the fiery moon. And moon meteors rain all over the planet, with a large chunk landing in a shy and a smaller chunk landing in Old Town. Eventually, Nissa Nissa gives birth to a son, and together they are able to end this first long night by turning her into a maiden made of light. Her son, Azor Ahai, then travels around Westeros, meeting with other old gods. In the Iron Islands, he was probably known as Balin Blackskin, and he found a black, oily stone there that he turned into the sea stone chair. In the Riverlands, Azor Ahai was probably known as the Green King of the God's Eye. And then eventually, he moved on to the Reach, where he was known as Garth Greenhand. And we learned that Garth Greenhand was a fertility creationist god. It was said everywhere he went, great lords and kings offered up their virgin daughters to him. I'm willing to bet that he probably had a hundred of them. Now that we know who Garth Greenhand is, let's move on to Old Town and try to peer through the fog of time and find out what really happened in this Old Town. Old Town. No history of the Reach is complete without a look at Old Town. How old is Old Town, truly? Many a maester has pondered that question, but we simply do not know. The origins of the city are lost in the mists of time and clouded by legend. Dragons once roosted on the Battle Isle until the first high tower put an end to them. The full and true history of the founding of Old Town will likely never be known. Okay, we get it. Old Town is old, and most of its history has been lost to time. So let's see if we can fill in some of the gaps. We can state with certainty, however, that men have lived at the mouth of the honey wine since the Dawn Age. If men have been there since the Dawn Age, that means Garth Greenhand must have been there at some point. Maester Jellico suggests that the settlement at the top of Whispering Sound began as a trading post, where ships from Valeria, Old Gis, and the Summer Isles put in to replenish their provisions, make repairs, and barter with the elder races. And that seems as likely a supposition as any. Valeria was not around in the Dawn Age, and I doubt Old Gis was either. Yet mysteries remain. The Stony Island, where the High Tower stands, is known as Battle Isle, even in our oldest records. But why? What battle was fought there? When? Between which lords, which kings, which races? Even the singers are largely silent on these matters. I think we can assume Garth Greenhand would have been involved with whatever happened at Battle Isle, as he ruled the Reach during this time. Even more enigmatic to scholars and historians is the great square fortress of Blackstone that dominates that isle. For most of recorded history, this monumental edifice has served as the foundation and lowest level of the high tower. Yet we know for a certainty that it predates the upper levels of the tower by thousands of years. More black stone. And this seems to be a much larger chunk of moon meteor than the sea stone chair. Who built it? When? Why? Most maesters accept the common wisdom that declares it to be a Valerian construction. For its massive walls and labyrinthine interiors are all of solid rock with no hint of joins or mortar, no chisel marks of any kind a type of construction that is seen elsewhere most notably in the Dragon Roads of the Freehold of Valeria. I'm just saying, this description sounds like some kind of godly man went up and touched it with his magical hands and transfigured its labyrinthine passages as he walked through it. If indeed this first fortress is Valerian, it suggests that the Dragon Lords came to Westeros thousands of years before they carved out their outpost on Dragonstone long before the coming of the Andals, or even the First Men. If so, did they come seeking treed? Were they slavers? Mayhaps seeking after giants? Did they seek to learn the magic of the children of the forest with their green seers and their werewoods? Or was there some darker purpose? Another mayhaps. And I'm going to say this whole passage is a lie. 
The Valerians did not exist during this time. If seafarers did come to Old Town in the Dawn Age, they must have sailed east to Westeros, coming from somewhere near Shy, fleeing the shadow or the broken meteor chunk that landed near there. More troubling and more worthy of consideration are the arguments put forth by those who claim that the first fortress is not Valerian at all. There we go, now someone's on the right track. The fused black stone of which it is made suggests Valeria, but the plain, unadorned style of architecture does not. For the Dragon Lords love little more than twisting stone into strange, fanciful, and ornate shapes. Okay, finally, we get some people who are using their eyes. Within the narrow, twisting, windowless passages strike many as being tunnels rather than halls. It's very easy to get lost among their turnings. Perhaps Garth Greenhand used his magical hands to transfigure the stone as he walked through investigating it. Mayhaps this is no more than a defensive measure designed to confound attackers, but it too is singularly unvalerian. I think this mayhaps helps us here, so now we know that it's not a defensive measure and not valerian. The labyrinthine nature of its interior architecture has led Archmaester Killian to suggest that the fortress might have been the work of the Maze Makers, a mysterious people who left remnants of their vanished civilization upon Lorith in the Shivering Sea. The notion is intriguing, but raises more questions than it answers. The maze makers of Lorath, huh? Looks like we're gonna have to take a closer look at them. An even more fanciful possibility was put forth a century ago by Maester Theron. Theron noted a certain likeness between the black stone of the ancient fortress and that of the sea stone chair, the high seat of House Greyjoy of Pike, whose origins are similarly ancient and mysterious. If Garth Greenhand is a Zora High and was born in the north, he would have had to pass the Iron Islands on his way to the Reach. There, he might have talked with the Drowned God and carved a black meteor into the sea stone chair. Theron's rather inchoate manuscript, Strange Stone, postulates that both fortress and seat might be the work of a queer, misshapen race of half-men, sired by creatures of the salt seas upon human women. These deep ones, as he names them, are the seed from which our legends of Merlins have grown, he argues whilst their terrible fathers are the truth behind the drowned god of the Arnborn. Just a quick theory here. If our demigod got with one of these deep ones, which produced a Merlin, and then he or one of his sons might have gotten with the Merlin, which created the Ironborn. Not really sure if there's any weight, but it was just a thought. The lavish, detailed, and somewhat disturbing illustrations included in Strange Stone make this rare volume fascinating to peruse, but the text is impenetrable in parts. Maester Theron had a gift for drawing, but little skill with words. Kinda like me, but I lack the art skill as well. In any case, his thesis has no factual basis and may safely be dismissed, and thus we find ourselves back whence we began, forced to concede that the beginnings of Old Town, Battle Isle, and its fortress must forever remain a mystery to us. Hey wait, let's not dismiss this guy just yet. Perhaps Battle Isle was a battle between Garth Greenhands and the Deep Ones. The reasons for the abandonment of the fortress and the fate of its builders, whoever they might have been, are likewise lost to us. But at some point we know that Battle Isle and its great stronghold came into the possession of the ancestors of House High Tower. I believe Garth abandoned this fortress after those so-called seafarers told him about a great stone that fell far to the east near a shy. Were they first men, as most scholars believe today? Or did they mayhaps descend from the seafarers and traders who had settled at the top of Whispering Sound in earlier epochs, the men who came before the first men. We cannot know. Ooh, this mayhaps hurts. It tells me one of my theories is wrong. I always figured that the High Towers were descended from the Seafarers and Garth Greenhand, but this must not be the case. They must be descendants of only Garth himself. And this will end our history of Old Town in the Dawn Age. If you made it this far, be sure to like and subscribe. If you don't know what else to watch, check one of these videos linked here at the end. If you want to join the discussion, look for the Discord link in the description. And once again, my name is Teach, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!